I hope you've been enjoying the day so far. I've certainly already learned a lot of things I didn't know this morning, which actually isn't that hard for me. Um, so today, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about uh, the Internet of Things and particularly the grid edge. What's happening out there at the far edge of the grid where assets are starting to bubble up and proliferate, multiply, and start to talk to each other and all that fun stuff. And how do we make this all happen? How do we make this uh, anarchy into something that's meaningful and creates value for utilities and customers? So today I have a very distinguished panel of three experts. And one of the things I learned a long time ago uh, moderating panels is that I'm best at outsourcing. That is, letting each of the panelists or guests introduce themselves so that I don't mess up the names. I one time had a distinguished woman from the subcontinent of India, and she taught me very, very well never to try the introductions again. So today, I have a Gordon Feller from Meeting of Minds, Brian Tansen, and Zoe Wood from Cisco and Accenture, respectively. And what I'd like to do is have each one of you introduce yourselves and the, the problem you're trying to solve, the opportunity you are working to address, or dare I say it, your mission. So if we can start with you, Gordon, a, a brief thumbnail of what you're working on and where this is all headed from your perspective. Well, good afternoon. I'm based in Silicon Valley. I've moved there since 1983. So my, my, I start from the technology side, focused on emerging technologies that are relevant to cities, and in that context, to utilities that work with cities. Uh, and that's how I've gotten to know ITRON and a lot of the ITRON partners. Uh, for the last seven and a half years, I was at Cisco headquarters in the group that is focused on IoT and developing technologies for smart cities, where I spent a lot of my time actually working with cities, helping them to think about the kinds of solutions that they want, whether it's from a utility partner or from a technology company who's a partner or from citizens who are, who are now engaged in building technology of their own. And uh, I'm on the board of an organization, a nonprofit organization that I helped to found when it was a twinkle in the eye of the president of the World Bank that was appointed by Bill Clinton in the mid-90s, spun out as an independent nonprofit organization based in Silicon Valley and sponsored by ITRON, AT&T, Cisco, and a lot of others that you would know. And the mission of that organization, where I'm on the board and where I also share that mission, is to try to bring together the different partners who represent different approaches to this problem to really reduce not just the uh, overlaps and the inefficiency of having a lot of different approaches that are not collaborating with each other, but really to help city leaders who are frankly befuddled in, often, in, in many cases because they see a lot of different approaches from a lot of different technology vendors. And my, my job and Meeting of the Minds role is to try to reduce that friction to make it easier for city leaders elected or appointed to really adopt these technologies that we're gonna talk about today. Thank you, and Brian. Uh, good afternoon, Brian Tonson. It's a pleasure to join you uh, for the panel. I'm leading, leading the industry solutions for Cisco for IoT. Uh, we're seeing IoT as really one of the biggest transitions in our laf lifetime, really, e even potentially bigger than the original internet, in that we're going from 5 billion devices, more or less, connected to the internet to over 20 billion uh, by 2020. And all of this exponentially increasing new data is transforming industries. And I'm leading what we're doing in manufacturing, where we're connecting to robots and enabling predictive maintenance and also cities that we're digitizing, uh, transportation. But one of the biggest opportunities that we see is the utility space with smart grid and the, the opportunities that we're driving together with our partners. So excited to be here. And we really see across all these industries, it's really a matter of connecting these things, moving the data in a secure way, connecting everything horizontally, vertically. That's really what Cisco is focused on, being that data fabric and the network fabric that it enables these new efficiencies to, to take, take place by moving the data to the application. Thank you, and Zoe. Hello everyone, my name is Zoe Wood. Um, I have, I'm part of Accenture Digital, and I've been working with utility clients for about 15 years. I started with Accenture in the Ottawa office up in Canada, and I'm now living in Silicon Valley, and so I've always had my fingers in the, the technology world, 
Ottawa, also known as uh, Silicon Valley of the North. Um, so happy to always kind of stay engaged from a technology perspective, but my role has always been to really work with utilities to use technologies to drive business outcomes. Um, and when we think about IoT and some of the trends that we've seen over the past couple of years, we've, we've really seen disruption across the value chain, you know, from generation, T and D, and on the customer side. And you know, just diving into the customer piece a little bit, because I think it's really interesting, one of the key challenges that we're trying to help our clients solve for is, is how to really engage customers. What is the, you know, I have this, we were about halfway through our smart meter deployments in North America, we still have a way to go, and we have this transactional data, which is a great foundation, but now I can get some real intelligence from that meter. I can get to know my customers better. I can get insights around their appliances in their home and really engage them in new and interesting ways. So I'm um, happy to be part of this panel here and, and share some thoughts with you. Thank you. Oh, and I did forget to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Peter Kelly Detweiler. I'm a contributor to Forbes and a principal at Northbridge Energy Partners. And my self-appointed goal is to figure out what's next. Um, so I read two to three hours a day and talk to really smart people, and that's why I'm up here, because I got three of them, and you get to listen. So this is a cocktail party without any booze, which is the unfortunate part, <laughs> um, but the rest of it's going to be just fine, and that party part happens later. So deferred joy is better joy. So Gordon, can you give us an example of how this whole IOT um, grid edge is creating value. In, in the cities and the, the utilities and the partners you're talking to, can you create some mental Velcro for us so we can walk away and go, oh, okay, I get how merging IT with assets and humanity actually makes us all better. What does that look like? Well, let me take an example that ITRON is involved in. Uh, it's in the city of Spokane, and tomorrow morning there'll be, I think, a, a, a fireside chat about this with an Avista executive. So Avista joined forces with ITRON and joined forces with Meeting of the Minds and with the city of Spokane where, where both Avista and ITRON are based and with Washington State University and created a, a, a joint project called Urbanova. And the idea was let's be useful in how we deploy these IoT solutions, whether it's sensors or gateway boxes or any of the other assets, and let's be useful to the city residents so the first priority, the low-hanging fruit in this case, was uh, deploying those sensors on, on smart outdoor street lights, modules sitting on top of the light pole, and the sensor would help us determine quality of air because Spokane gets a lot of forest fire smoke from Canada. We've got to build that wall so the smoke doesn't come over, but until we do, there's a real problem with that smoke, and uh, it shows up on the city budget when people have asthma conditions, uh, COPD, respiratory distress, show up in a hospital, lots of, lots of hidden and not so hidden costs. But the idea of that and numerous other projects was to use the smarts at Avista, use the technology that ITRON provides, use the Washington State University engineering talent pool to do the big data analytics because enough data is streaming off of those sensors and off of those smart street lights in the university district uh, that somebody needs to help figure out what little insights can be gained from the big data. So here you have at the edge of the network, um, both a wired and wireless network because we're experimenting with different ways of transporting the data. We have a lot of interesting data that's really an avalanche of data that needs to be translated into things that are actionable for ordinary people or for a public health official or for somebody that shouldn't want, doesn't want to drive on a day when it's a, it's a spare the air day. So that kind of alert of emergency or coming emergency with, with air quality, you know, is a very kind of clear manifestation that IoT is not just for the techie, the benefit is not just for ITRON or Avista to manage complex distributed digital assets, the benefit can show up for the ordinary person. So bits and bytes translated into value for you and me. In this case, better public health, better productivity, less lost time, from work or family because somebody's been warned in advance to be careful about going outdoors and jogging on a day when they shouldn't. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. So Zoe, in the far-flung empire that is Accenture, how does, how does this um, emerging digitization 
uh, create value for the partners and the customers that you're working with on a daily basis? Well, I think it's, it's really interesting. You know, one of the, a common challenge that we've seen within utilities as well as other industries is really the, the game is changing. So there's this blurring line between different industries and you know, we, we see some services being provided by Google that are the same services that are being provided by Comcast, which are the same services that can be offered by potentially my utility. So for example, um, that can, we've done some work in, with Electric Ireland um, where we've deployed a connected home. So a consumer has their app, they can get real-time data on their usage, their billing, the Electric Ireland can engage with those customers. And so there's this constant stream of communication and Electric Ireland is now getting information on how that customer is using different appliances and can push you know, new offers, whether it's new products or new services. We actually did some research, some primary research, and we found that 54% of people would be open to sharing their data with their utility in exchange for personalized offers. So there's value, there's real value that a customer can get from some of these you know, personalized information. So it, it's really turning that data into new offers. And also, um, I think one of the fundamental changes is, is the, the changing business model. So for utilities, what is that model for them to provide their data to other providers potentially? Are they a data aggregator? Are they a data supplier? Do they manage the platform or the ecosystem? Uh, how do they monetize that and, and what does that mean? So fundamental changes in, in the business model is one of the key challenges as well. Great, thank you. So Brian, when, you, when you're sitting down with, let's say it's a utility customer, um, certainly partners need to be involved in this conversation because no single entity can handle the challenge which is in front of us. And we, we see that downstairs when we walk into that room and there's that whole constellation of, of partners and allies in the space. When you sit down with the utility to have this conversation, um, where does it start? Does it start with the end in mind, what you might call teleology, for those of us who are looking for big and useless words, or, um, or does it basically start with, oh, I've got these solutions and I think they can do this? How do you launch into that conversation with the utility and partners to come up with something meaningful? Yeah, it's a good question. We're, we're working with utilities around the world mm -hmm. and with partners around the world, ITRON. Is, is, a, is, a, is a very special partner of ours. And what we find is you really need to start with the business model and how you're gonna help drive new revenues for the utility, operational efficiencies, keep safety high. And you really start with the business problem and then work back from that to the technology. And I would also say, just, just building on, on what Gordon and, and Zoe were talking about, we've seen that business volume change over time. And if I go back a couple of years, uh, you know, there's a great story that was public with Duke and how they had a $350 million concrete saving that was validated by a, an independent auditor by s putting in smart meters. And you know, they built um, RF mesh, IP base, uh, put in smart meters, getting millions of new data points, let them reduce line loss and get a lot of new data that drove efficiency. But what's interesting is we're now seeing this evolve into a new phase where they want to take that same investment in the communications and the network and the applications and extend it into new areas. So battery powered devices and water and um, other utilities where it's, it's not actually in this case necessarily new discovery, but it's how do you take the same value that you got in one area and now bring it into new domains and get better leverage of that infrastructure. And then I think we'll probably talk more about it, but the future is really cities. And how do they now move into smart cities? And that's a whole new business model again. But we, we find you know, you've got to really uh, uh, focus on the business model and how can they work in the regulatory environment. So there's an evolution of the conversation then. Yeah. Once, once an entity learns it can do X, then it says, oh, okay, I got it. Now I move on to Y. Yeah, exactly. It's a multi-year journey, you yeah. know, and, and I think we're moving from 20-year business cases <laughs> to, you know, now even much more evolved business cases which affect with a much faster refresh of that technology. The world's changing again, you know, very rapidly for utilities. Great, thank you. So, Gordon, you, in facilitating these conversations with various partners and entities, um, and to, to Zoe's point about sometimes 
this entity is doing X and Y, and sometimes it's only doing these pieces. How do you help to navigate between what each one of the parties wants to be doing in that space? How do you help move that conversation along? And, and where, where are the booby traps and where does the major tension potentially lie in those conversations? Well, it, it all goes back to Watergate. <coughs> um, <laughs> to, uh, if you remember your Watergate history, Mr. Deep Throat, who- That movie's coming out, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you'll get a refresh on your, your, your American political history. Um, Deep Throat, who was Mark Felt mm -hmm. uh, at the FBI, basically said, follow the money. And so that's, that's our guide, which is let's look to see who's going to benefit the most and in what ways do those revenue streams represent new possibilities, perhaps, because companies are built to follow the money. And they are most interested, of course, in serving the customer in ways that results in new revenue streams on top of old revenue streams, preferably, uh, because it's always best to have additive rather than replacement income. And so that's where we start. We say to all of the stakeholders, which could be the city, uh, certainly is a city government, looking to accomplish their goals for their stakeholders, which generally doesn't involve as much of the revenue mentality as it does the operational cost control. Uh, but, but our argument is that we have to have both of these factors, that you have to look to reducing operating costs, reducing capex, and at the same time increasing either existing revenue or adding new revenue streams. So it's always about, and uh, it sounds so crass, it's always about the money. Uh, but this is what brings people to the table and gets them started in a conversation. S you know, the old business model, of course, for utilities, which now is being blown up, is it's better to sell more of a thing than less. We're now in a world, you know, about resource efficiency and resource scarcity. So utilities are being pushed by regulators and by customers to essentially sell less of a thing and still try to make money at that. And that's not a hard, that's not an easy thing to do. It's really hard and it's going to be difficult for utilities to go through the transition, which is why many utilities that we're talking to are now talking with cities, not just about the normal customer conversation, but about the smart cities revolution, because they see the potential for using their wired and wireless networks that they've built to do the things that utilities do to also on top of that network potentially provide other services to other end users or maybe to the same end users that they're serving already. And that's a great way to start a conversation. How do we get more money? How do we spend less money? And how do we improve the economic development of the community that we're serving? And you know, the latter, uh, increasingly, I'm finding utilities consider to be part of their central mission because it raises, it lifts all boats. And that growth of the local community, because the utility is embracing technology, is not just a job creator. It's going to elevate the whole potential for the region that that utility serves. So value stacking can be important in terms of multiple value streams. So let's stick with Mr. Felt for a moment there in Watergate. So Zoe, if, if Mr. Felt were here uh, and he were part of that conversation with the utilities who want to make an investment in these efficiencies, fusing the resources with increasing levels of machines, if you will, in IT, at what point wouldn't Mr. Felt pick o bend over and pick up the money? What's the IRR or the simple payback period you have to achieve in, in these conversations in order for people to be interested and feel like they're going to get the blessing of the PUC. Is it a 10% you know, uh, or rate of return or you know, what does that look like? It's a very interesting question and I'll say I'm Canadian so my US history may not be up to snuff <laughs> but I'll just follow the example. The, um, I think follow the loony. Yeah, 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 yeah. the loony. Yeah. Um, so you know, from, well, I think what we've seen is a change in the mindset in terms of payback and, and value return on that investment. I think I, I agree that gone are the days that it's like a 20 year payback for, for certain investments. I see we see much more iterative decision making with our clients and one of the key, key changes I think we've seen is that in a lot of these discussions is both folks from business and IT that are at the table I think I, uh, what we've seen is IoT is very much a, many times a, a business-led decision. It's value for the utility, value for the business, but the IT is, is absolutely there kind of partnering. So I think it's, it's helping to break down those silos that ex have existed for, for many years in these organizations. 
And I think what we're trying, or what, we, what we've seen with some of these initiatives is getting apps or, or tools in the hands of consumers very quickly, you know, within four to six months of period, and then having that accelerated and have that immediate, essentially, a return on investment. Great, thanks. So I wanna sharpen the focus on the value prop. So Brian, when, when you're sitting down with the utility, um, you say to the person sitting across the table, I can offer you X to help solve your problem. What does that X look like? And then what are the other complementary, complementary services you need from other players on that board to bring the whole thing to fruition? Yeah, so I'll give a couple examples. One is on the top line uh, with revenue. So as you see more and more e efficiencies in energy use, top line can actually be declining for utilities. So how do you make up that revenue? Well, mm -hmm. cities is a really natural opportunity to go into the cities, use the investment they've already made, and use that to, to connect intelligent street lights or waste management. Lots of opportunities in the city to then grow that top line. So then that's the top line conversation we'd have. You can make that happen. There's partners like what Cisco's done. We're in 38 cities right now. Uh, we've built an ecosystem of about 80 ISDs. So bringing, it's really- Wait, ISDs, I'm uh, sorry. ISDs, sorry, independent software vendors that are, okay. that are getting data from street lights and parking and so forth and then building applications on top of that. So that is very much a partner conversation to drive those, the, the top line revenue growth. And I, I would also highlight what, what you mentioned around regulatory changes because I think back to the mid 1990s where it was about deregulation way back and that was really driving new business models and a lot of new thinking for the utilities. It's kind of getting into that world again because if you go into the smart city space, that's a whole new regulatory animal that you're gonna be facing. So the regulatory environment becomes very critical. Also things like software as a service, et cetera. Uh, but then there's other areas like, soft, uh, like efficiencies where we, you know, it's, it's, it's much easier to drive cost savings. So like uh, we have a recent opportunity as simple as putting IoT into technical service fleets, thousands of technical service fleets, where we know where they are, we know if the right people are going on the right call, if they have the right things in the truck to build the customer use need. You know, tons and tons of cost savings that you can get on optimizing those truck rolls by now you know, using IoT to hook up those service vehicles. So lots of opportunities. Thank you. So I was speaking of knowing where people are and their vehicles and that sort of thing. I was at a conversation at a municipal level and we had uh, engineering firms, EPCs, software, solar vendors, software vendors, et cetera. And the city manager said, one of my challenges is getting past what I lovingly call the ick factor, which is people knowing where everybody is all the time, maybe in the name of efficiency, he said, but smart meters in my city, I have a certain number of people who fear that level of pervasive knowledge. How do we make sure that that is something that is benign, uh, both perceived to be benign and really benign? How do we uh, take the appropriate safeguards to make sure that this thing works for the benefit of everybody? Um, you're nodding your head. Gordon? Uh, we, we went through this exercise recently in the Department of Energy's advisory committee for the, for the secretary, and it goes something like this. The Europeans have very stringent digital privacy, mm -hmm. data privacy, yeah. data security requirements that they impose on utilities, on retailers, on financial institutions, on transit agencies. Uh, for instance, if you have a camera on the street and you take a picture mm -hmm. of a vehicle, maybe for the purposes of, uh, of making a, um, uh, a penalty fine for not paying a toll or paying a parking ticket, uh, you have to black out the face and you have to black out the license plate unless you have a court order mm -hmm. to unblacken it. And technology providers comply. It's a big enough market with 350 million or so residents uh, with you know multiple trillions of dollars of GDP. That's enough demand to pull the innovation from the suppliers of technology to comply with that. And you have strong regulators in Brussels and each of the 25 member states who are essentially enforcing those rules. So it's, it's not rocket science. It we have the done. technology. Mm -hmm. We have a, a case where the regulation has been provided to protect 
consumers and citizens, and it seems to be working pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I, I would offer that as, you know, for, for those who think this is a business killer, um, it actually could be an innovation generator. So you wanted to add something? I was something. just gonna add a, a couple of quick examples. Um, we've done some work outside of utilities, but in the mining industry, where we've deployed solutions that, that track worker location on a pervasive, consistent basis. And the, the key value for the workers, I think the unionized uh, workforce, it was all about safety. And having, it, three, through negotiations with the uh, unions, we focused on safety, we made sure that we didn't change, we're not changing work process, we simply wanted to give a device to the workers that would detect uh, gas, so different sensors, d different um, components in the air, and also track the location. So it was about safety, knowing where people are, keeping them safe, and, and we've, we've done that at Rio Tinto and Kennecott, um, Marathon Oil, and some other examples as well. Thank you. So a couple years ago I was at a conference and there was a person talking about software and an app they built. It was in the city of Boston where they named every fire hydrant in the whole city. And after a blizzard or a storm, neighborhoods would shovel out their fire hydrants so if there was a problem, the police would get there. And the city had a map with every fire hydrant and people would text in saying, I just cleared bill. If there's a bill out there, sorry about that. Um, and so basically the city would know which hydrants were cleared and which ones were not. And that story stuck with me as an example of a really beneficial way of taking an app and some IoT and creating value and also humanizing it. Um, can you provide me some examples uh, where, beyond the one you talked about in Spokane, other ones of you know, where this is providing real appreciable value today, where you walk away at the end of the day, you drive home and you go, this is a really cool project that I'm involved in. I really love this one. Zoe, what, yeah. what, what really sort of floats a, the boat? I'll share with you a story that um, a colleague shared with me just yesterday, actually. So one of my colleagues, he has a, um, a rental property in Florida, and he works for Accenture, travels all the time, always on the road. And um, so he has this rental property, and he used his app to just check out the, the, the usage stats on, on his, using his phone. So he went into his app, went into the site, and he noticed that there was an outage. And he had guests that were coming to stay at this property later that day. So mode of panic set in for him, because it would not only be no, no power when the people showed up, but Florida heat, he, you know, the, the temperature would probably mm -hmm. just be ungodly. So um, he raised an alert through the app. Within four minutes, power had been restored to his property in Florida. And that was his particular example. And I would take that two steps further. So one, we know that the technology exists to push a notification to customers when there is an outage. So he could have received a notification before finding out for himself Furthermore, he could then connect with his Nest uh, device at home and start to you know, take that temperature down as quickly as possible. So this interaction of data and the end-to-end -end use case where it's, it's value, yes, value to have power, but value to be notified because it saved me time, and then value to turn down the temperature so it's ready for my house guests. Thanks, and Gordon, you said you- I have a variation of that. So Toronto-based software company, I'm on the board, zero footprint. Um, organized as a nonprofit, built a, a software tool because the, the founder who invested the, the capital wanted to reduce total greenhouse gas emissions from, uh, from the users, help them essentially get from you know, red to yellow to green, and pushing uh, information from the utility to the individual about their use, mm -hmm. uh, but also doing something else, which is kind of the interesting twist which is enabling a neighborhood that wants to significantly reduce their own carbon footprint and their own consumption of energy and water, uh, giving them the tools to be able to essentially look at the neighborhood as a whole to say, you know, our, our six block area is beating that six block area by, you know, light years and we're gonna continue to do that and pushing uh, ideas about showering at different times or I'm from San Francisco, maybe showering together or any number of other options that might be on your phone that you would see, you know, I can do my laundry at a different time yeah. and help my neighborhood beat the other neighborhoods in the race to, you know, climate sanity. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. You got one, Brian? Uh, yeah, a, a great example of maybe, maybe not as good as interesting as that one, but uh, I think about uh, smart cities. Uh, the city of Jaipur in India, uh, if I had my phone with me, I could show you, but they, they built a smart application and you can pull up your on your iPhone uh, the Jaipur app and you can d dial in and you can actually see what's the parking availability in Jaipur, right? And I, I heard the other day that 30% of traffic in large cities can be drawn, caused by people just driving around looking to try to find a parking spot. So you can see the real-time environmental conditions in the city uh, through pollution levels. You can see even, you know, the waste uh, collection, you know, is the uh, trash bin nearby, does it need to be collected or not? If you think about city services, you know, the cost savings that that can drive. But anyway, I, I found that fascinating where you, you know, really a, a great example of digitizing a city. So, um, by the way, can everyone hear Brian? It's, it sounded to me like he was cutting in and out. Um, you might have to either move that up a little or, thank you. Um, did any of you hear the story about the girl with the Alexa and the dollhouse? Okay, so this is a story about how technology can lead to unintended consequences. I think she was four or five. Anyway, she told Alexa she wanted a dollhouse. Mm -hmm. So a dollhouse arrives. And I think the parents gave it to charity or something. But the cool thing was that the news then told this story about Alexa and a dollhouse. And Alexa, in many homes with televisions on, picked up the story. And more dollhouses <laughs> arrived in more places. At least that's the story that I heard. Whether or not it's true or not, I love it. Um, a similar story, Austin, I, I moderate a panel with a VP of customer service in Austin, and they have a bring your own thermostat program. Austin Energy. Austin Energy, yeah. excuse me, yep. And so you can get a Honeywell thermostat, you can get a Nest and so on. And you get a rebate if you connect it to the utility and they use it for demand response and managing load. So about a year into the program, year and a half in, they got either a phone call or an email from someone saying, I moved to San Francisco. I took my Nest with me. It's a $300, $200 thermostat. Can you please disconnect <laughs> my thermostat because you're messing me up big time in San Francisco. You know Mark Twain's thing about the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. That was their problem. And Austin Energy was still connected to and controlling that distributed device now thousands of miles away. So can any of you give me an example of unintended consequences where you were creating something you thought was going to be this, and then you ended up with a dollhouse? Well, many of you heard about Link NYC and the problems that they had in deploying smart public kiosks on the streets of New York. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> Mayor Bloomberg, this is this, a uh, bit risque. Yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, Mayor Bloomberg did a deal where he wanted to take the old pay phones, which had great connectivity for power and in some cases for fiber, and turn them into essentially uh, iPhones on steroids. Uh, large, on the street, uh, connected, uh, very high speed Wi Fi hotspot, enabling emergency communications two ways, a uh, video camera, lots of cool you know, opportunities to do lots of amazing things, all financed by advertising. Uh, the problem was that the very first adopters, as was the case with Beta and VHS, were porn users who decided they wanted to be on the streets watching that stuff. It didn't really go over very well with the residents, and it, it backfired, so they disconnected the you can watch the movie function. But it turned out to be a very useful lesson learned, which was, this is not something that you can do willy-nilly. You have to really think about who is the end user on the street in a smart city or a dumb city or a big city or a small city or an old city or a poor city. You know, we really have to think through as we're deploying these things, uh, where, where is the, the low-hanging fruit for somebody who's passing by? Um, uh, just an unfortunate case of New York City showing their way. Uh, yeah. I would, I would Say also, just to, if I can add, um, security becomes very important mm -hmm. in this in these areas because you are, as you connect these things, increasing the theoretical attack vectors that you can run into, and, and that's almost an example of, of security. And what I think finding the right partners to work with that, that can, can secure the environment is really, really critical. And, and the trend that we're seeing in the industry is moving beyond even the firewalls and 
advanced uh, malware protections, et cetera, to really knowing the identity and the policy of these IoT devices. So that it, if you have a robot in a factory or a smart meter, it shouldn't be trying to go to Amazon to order a book. You know, you should know what the behavior is expected, what it's going to be connecting to, and really lock down these IoT devices. And if you do it that way, you can actually make these environments more secure than they were even in the past with more proprietary systems. Can you make them fully secure? I mean, I, I, I would say I have an advanced level of paranoia. You might have heard that thing in the news about the NSA employee who took his laptop out and then uh, apparently Kaspersky software pulled from it um, all this information around spies and then the Israelis were able to track the Russian government which was ferreting out the information on locations of US spies around the world. And I have this paranoia that, you know, I used to know my credit rating, now everybody does, mm -hmm. um, and maybe my social security number. Can we, as we build out this network of interconnected devices and everything will have, you know, billions and billions and billions of things have sensors on them and they can create denial of service attacks, your toaster can do that sort of thing. I mean, can we really create an entirely secure world or are we assembling um, something which could really come back and bite us in the ankle or worse sometime in the future? How do you respond to that kind of a fear-based question? Yeah, I, I would say that what we found is you can't just secure the perimeter anymore because uh, people thought, well, I can secure my factory, for example, yeah. or my smart grid, but then the workers in the plant uh, can be the primary security risk, you know, with, with open USB ports and, and yeah. issues like that. So you've got to secure the whole thing, not just the perimeter. It can't be a hard shell, soft middle anymore. You've got to really protect pervasively to the edge security all the way to the edge device, and again, the identity, the policy, knowing who's connecting, knowing who, where they are in the world, the location services, that kind of next generation security becomes very, very critical. And that's the kind of uh, solution that we're deploying today. And also things like zonal isolation, so if you have an issue, you can contain it. It's not gonna be able to break out into other areas. It becomes very important. But there is a view in Silicon Valley that we're, we're sort of finishing this peculiar short phase in history where there was privacy, uh -huh. and that prior to that there wasn't any, and soon there'll be none, and people, this is not necessarily my position, but it's a, it's a position that a lot of tech executives believe when they're amongst friends and they'll express this view, that privacy is finished, and that it was an accident of history, and we should get over it. And uh, technically that may not be a very sophisticated way of, of explaining the vulnerability, but it's certainly a, 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 an increasingly pervasive view in Silicon Valley. Hmm. So I was just going to add, um, you know, I think it's a really interesting topic. I think I looked at my uh, BBC News earlier today, and there was another devices, <laughs> and there was a picture of all sorts of devices and, and concerns. So it's, it's definitely a concern, and I, I fully agree. It's about looking at all the different levels. Um, but I think one of the key challenges is that there are so many players that are involved, whether it's hardware, software, the endpoints, the endpoints. One uh, visualization that we put together to help illustrate this, it's hard to describe, but it was essentially um, a dashboard showing different IT systems as well as OT systems. And the algorithm was ferreting out a suspicious activity. And it wove through both of the IT links as well as the OT links to have visibility across the system of, of what was happening. And that was interesting to be able to, to look at the trends and be able to analyze that and identify it in advance. Okay, so let's assume for a moment, we'll make the heroic assumption that we can get past, or we can address those issues successfully. If we take something like the New York Rev model which essentially suggests that in the near future, we'll have utilities with distributed assets that are grid and energy aware. So the battery behind the meter, um, the lighting system, the building automation systems, et cetera, will know or at least be capable of being told they have to perform a series of strategies. The battery needs to charge, discharge, the electric vehicle, same thing. The building automation system needs to change the, te the temperature set point from 68 to 72 degrees for the next three hours, and the lights need to dim 25%. Um, how do you 
make those sorts of things happen at the scale of millions or tens of millions of those things. Because the New York Rev model postulates a future where all the way along the grid edge, there are these smart devices that are creating and optimizing value within a market context, as well as the needs of the consumer, right? How do you um, create the IT framework to make that happen? Um, some people suggest blockchain, but what do the three of you think? I, I would have to say just fundamentally is global open standards. Uh -huh. So uh, ISO is partnering now with the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC, mm -hmm. um, which is the, you know, the primary resource for utilities around the world to have common standards. That's why we have AC versus DC at the voltages that we do. That's why we have USB. It's all at the, at the IEC where that happens. But now ISO and ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, are partnering with the IEC. So we're, we're going to be getting soon uh, more than just published standards, which is a good starting point, but rapid adoption of those standards. So uh, that's absolutely crucial. Common global open standards that are IP based uh, and that are accessible to all uh -huh. and that vendors will build their technology to synchronize with that and to be compatible with that because the basis for interoperability of all of those multiple types of devices in a New York Rev model uh, is that everybody is sharing a common data standard, a common data transmission protocol, et cetera. That was the power of TCP IP mm -hmm. uh, that made it all possible for us to be doing the things we're doing today. So uh, I would say, you know, if I had one thing to pin pinpoint, it would be the adoption by your companies and many more of common global open standards that are secure. And those are being built as we speak. And that's not a small thing. Anything to add? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would add, um, it, it's, it's a really great question because it, it's almost more important than security. Because when we looked at all the billions of devices you need to connect, and then how long it's gonna, it takes to install these devices, secure them, set them up, there, there's not enough IT professionals in the world <laughs> to actually make this happen. And so what we're really investing in is automation, and intelligence in the network edge and because complexity is really the big barrier to IoT adoption. And you know, utilities I think is farther than other industries. Uh, but how do you make it plug and play? How do you make it simple, including the security policies so that you plug in a device, it knows what it is, it knows the security policy that's associated with it, getting rid of all the manual work, making it more automated. That's really a big goal of Cisco's. I think it's a big goal of OpenWay, Riva as well, and these other uh, technologies. Is that, that's gotta be no priority number one. Make it simple, plug and play, to, to be able to deploy and manage and secure. So uh, I'll just add a, a point from a, from a mobility perspective. You know, for enterprise applications, you know, we see many of our clients going with the bring your own device model. And so when those devices are now talking to your meter and talking to you know, back end systems at the utility, um, how I, I think that's a, a, you know, one of the challenges. So I think I, you know, there's, there's standards and then technologies really around mobility as well as IoT, they are changing so quickly. So your operating system upgrades, your device mm -hmm. upgrades, whether it's software, hardware, everything has a different set of standards. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's establishing it, but then having a, an engine to keep it fresh, keep it up to date and, and ahead of potential issues. Great. Um, I want to not monopolize this conversation because I'm sure there's a few folks out there with, with a burning desire to ask a question. Um, if you have one, there's one right there. If you can please stand up and identify yourself. There's a mic right here. I'm um, right over here. This gentleman. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Luke Scheidler from Itron. Um, uh, this is an example specific to the energy industry, but it would be equally applicable to IoT, smart cities. Um, you know, in, in energy, you see uh, lots of great analytic vendors around solar and around storage and around your thermostat and every other distributed resource. And um, in many cases, not all of them, but in many cases, uh, each individual's analytic offering would be stronger if paired with data from other vendors, other companies, other partners. Have you guys seen any business models emerging that effectively encourage the sharing of data amongst the community that it's gonna to take to really optimize the system? 
Well, this happened in the Netherlands with a bunch of the utilities who got together. The Dutch are very cooperative people and, and uh, fun to work with each other. And they like to do it over coffee shops and all that stuff. And basically, they got together as competitors, um, generators, distributors, transmission companies, uh, the ones who were strictly on the retail side, and they all created a common data pool. And uh, the government gave their blessing because it had to be essentially vetted for collusion uh, since their their anti-competitive and um, their potential anti-competitive implications. Uh, and it's it's worked really well. Um, the one company that's prospered the most from it was the upstart Aliander, and uh, they're they're a really interesting company because of this. So they're. You know, they're mining this data. There's a company that was formed as a result of it. Um, I'll think of the name, but a lot of innovation came out of the Netherlands around big data analytics for, oh yes, Energy Works with an X was the Dutch company that came out of this that's really done some amazing things with analyzing these big data sets in real time, whether it's for a building owner or a government agency that has multiple locations or utility scale. and. I think it proves the point that if you can do that with a country that's of manageable size, uh, the Dutch economy is actually quite large even though the geography is quite small because their companies are quite wealthy. Yeah, I think um, this is another number one issue, <laughs> probably a third one with security and complexity, is the data standards and the lack thereof. Uh, you know, I think the key is, you know, ultimately you are seeing individual industries start to put in standards, not full adoption yet, but, and there's a, I, I think the key is to work with partners that are open and are willing to let the data flow and unleash the data so that you can build that ecosystem around it. And, you know, I know what we're trying to do is, is really build, build the, um, the APIs and the, a and, and the data, kind of be the open neutral data broker to let data flow between different parties. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, that's gonna move into standards, uh, but it's gonna take a while, so I think the partner selection, working with open partners that value openness is, is the way to get started. Thank you. Uh, anything to add, Zoe? I think that is yeah, we've definitely experienced that as well. I think that it's a it's kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy. I'm going to build my tool. I'm going to have the software. I'm going to have the data, and no one's going to talk. But I think now more and more we, we need to cut across those 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 systems. Um, there's some work that we did in the UK with, with Thames Water where we connected all of the, the waterways with sensors to manage flow, temperature, different data points uh, from the water. And that data was shared with, and so a lot of work that Accenture does is bringing together those people, provide, being the neutral party, if you will, to, to create that um, openness to, to share. And so that data from Thames Water was shared with different partners of Thames and helped manage the waterways throughout um, that geographic area. Thank you. Do we have time for another question? Yeah, okay. Anybody else out there? Now, how much time do we have left, by the way? I just, sorry. Oh, great. All right. So no more questions out there. We put everybody Ah, here we go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Henry Presente with iTron. I'm wondering, with all this, uh, the world of possibilities with IoT, where do you see the dead ends? You mentioned, for example, data privacy. There are certain aspects of it that may not be as relevant 30 years from now as they are today. Maybe it's a cultural expectation about privacy, and certain initiatives or, or ways of thinking about it may not survive the long term. What might be another area where you see a lot of investment right now, maybe we should dial it back? Zoe? Well, I think it's a great question. The, and I don't think it's necessarily a roadblock, but I think it's it's an area to really to watch is, is really the regulatory environment. I think we're seeing changes uh, to that, but I think that will be you know, how utilities can monetize some of these IoT technologies and, and how we can make the investment, how we can facilitate that will be very much based on uh, the rate case and, and the regulatory environment. Um, we are seeing some, some changes in that in, in New York. Uh, the New York Power Authority is uh, embarking on this very interesting vision of an integrated supply and demand management across New York State. I believe there's seven different utilities that are involved in that. So think about the information sharing, the collaboration across those utilities. Um, 
So as regulations change, I think I think that's just something not necessarily roadblock, block, but it, but something to uh, that may right. impact speed. I would give a, a second example that I think is very important, which is it, make sure you're buying equipment that's standards-based today. And we look at standards like YSUN 1.0 that um, we're supporting, and, and uh, ITRON I think is on the board. But that's that's just one example. But the we're seeing that come up in more and more RFQs because certainly if you're making huge investments in equipment that's not standards-based, it's not future-proof, then that can certainly be a dead end that you, you're going to regret in a couple years. Gordon. And I'll, I'll pick a third example, in, in this <coughs> case not utility-focused but more city-focused. A lot of city leaders who are embracing technology and moving their cities into smart mode are looking down the road and they see autonomous vehicles coming at them and they're concerned about dramatic declines in revenue because the dirty little secret in municipalities is that parking revenue is very significant uh, because it's a way of generating revenue without a tax. And so suddenly when you have an autonomous vehicle with a 24-7 duty cycle moving around, capturing passengers, moving them around, not parking, going out of town to get cleaned up because of whatever somebody was eating in the, in the back, that kind of lack of parking revenue and parking ticket revenue is going to change the budget for cities. So what's happened is some cities have said, well, we need to find new sources of revenue. Let's tax outdoor advertising in new ways because there's going to be an outdoor advertising boom in a smart city that knows who you are, where you've been, where you're going, and what your preferences are. And so this is something which I think is a dead end for cities. And cities need to rethink their business model the way the utilities are doing that. And you know, we may have different sources of revenue at different scales as a result of the transformations that are taking place. I think we probably will. Thanks. So we have about six minutes left. I'd like to challenge each one of you for a closing statement painting a rosy picture of, you know, if this all worked out, for example, Zoe, if you could conjure up the vision of that connected world on the grid edge the way it should play out, what would that look like to you? I would say, for, for me, it's the utility knows me, my preferences, my behaviors, and is able to deliver services that meet my needs on a day in and day out basis. And what would those services look those like? Those services would be, um, I would say that it's time of, time of use, you know, rates mm -hmm. and alerts and when I'm using within the different tiers. Um, and then notifications on potential appliance issues because I know that all the sand in my kids' clothes has like killing my washer and dryer. <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure that pg e knows that today, but I, I, I need that information. Thank you. <laughs> and Brian, what would that world look like to you? You know, I, I would say, I, I remember seeing a, a, an ad on TV a number of years ago, I think in the Super Bowl about imagine this world where you could have energy efficiency and you could bring goods to market with lower cost and you know you could really say impact the planet with efficiency and I think what we're talking about with IOT is really truly on that scale you heard numbers this morning about you know 20% energy reduction usage you know, we're seeing in manufacturing you can almost eliminate uh, quality defects through data and information you can accelerate these supply chains you can you know it's just an amazing opportunity if you really pl run all this out to increase efficiency 20, 30, 40 percent in everything across the planet. I think that's very exciting, and, and the key to make that happen, it's not just security, but it's, it's again, this open flow of data. Let the data flow, you know, you, you're gonna have to be able to connect everything, but then let the data flow to all these applications to drive and capture that value. Gordon. Since I'm the guy from Silicon Valley, I guess I'll say, um, not mine, but what I'm hearing in the Valley uh, for the answer to this question, is AI will advance to the point where uh, the number of robots who are performing work for us dramatically increases, let's say 20 years from now, um, and where work as we know it is over, um, and where those machines, you know, hopefully at our, our command, are freeing us to do the kinds of creative things that we want to do with our families, with our, our creative pursuits, uh, with our personal interest in knowledge and, and art, and the city senses who we are and knows what we're interested in and is responsive to that. So 
not so much the, res the smart city as the responsive city um, and the utility and the learning institutions and the healthcare institutions that make the city what it is, uh, you know, really responds to our, our command and that, that that is a possibility that people in Silicon Valley who lead significant companies are building toward the, the end of work as we know it. Uh, which will change all of the economics that we take for granted, which is why a lot of Silicon Valley leaders are talking about universal basic income. So it sounds like we're facing an uncertain, very uncertain future, and the best way for us to be involved in it is for us to be responsible for creating it. Would that be a fair summary? Okay, I well, thank you. You want itron to create it. You want itron to create it. <laughs> Excellent. And, and how many shares do I own? Not enough. Well, I, wanna th I want you to join me in thanking three great panelists uh, for enlightening us all. Thank you so much.